last spring and help kind of set up Dr. Quinn coming to speak to us here for the fall series. He's here actually with his brother and nephew, sport fishing, having fun, but I convinced him to come give us a quick science talk here. So um, Dr. Quinn is a professor at UW and he's been there 30 years-ish and basically has the textbook on salmon as far as I'm concerned and um, just like to welcome Dr. Quinn giving us a talk tonight. Um, thanks for taking time out of your Tuesday evening, tear yourself away from the fishing or families or whatever else it is uh, you're doing. And I'm here with my brother and my nephew, and so we're sort of poaching a little bit of time. We, we gobble dinner quick. But I am very grateful to the folks here for taking the time because it's, it's fun to see folks with an interest. I love talking about salmon, uh, and so let's go. This is uh, kind of get you in the mood. You know, maybe you had dinner, maybe you didn't, but then it'll be the bear. Um, okay, is this gonna work? Let's give that a try again. Where do I have to point this? At the computer. If not, maybe I turned it off instead of turning it on, on the side of it, clicker. Mm. Where it says on. Yeah, I probably turned it off. Yeah, you did, it's okay. <laughs> So you're from Alaska, you understand, this is the, the image that everyone in America and even some Alaskans have of bears preying on salmon, right? It's either the Brooks Falls with a sockeye, McNeil Falls, a chum. This is highly photographed. I mean, this bear is probably photographed more than, I don't know, Beyonce and Madonna combined. But, <laughs> but it's really not typical of the bear predation. It's not what I'm going to talk about. I've been there. It's kind of cool. It's sort of fun to go to, but it's not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is much more typical, uh, bear preying on salmon in a small stream, kind of no news, no photographers, but it happens lots and lots and lots of times. So I like this for several reasons. First, this is my son when he was not yet five, my first field assistant, and he's saying, Daddy, what happened to this salmon here? And it's a cute picture. He's now 27, so it's in my rear view mirror, but I like to remind myself of my son but also I like this quote because it keeps me very, very humble. It's not as though the fact that bears eat salmon is any new discovery, like I've just caught into something special. One can walk along almost any Alaska salmon stream in bear country during the summer, and you could have British Columbia, spawning season, see jaws, heads, and other parts of salmon left by bears. The fact that bears eat salmon is not news, but like a lot of things in ecology, there are layers and layers, and I think in many cases that the story is hiding in plain view and you peel the onion, you get down through a few layers and there are some intricacies and maybe some things that would be intuitive but not necessarily for sure and maybe a few surprises. So here we go, thanks Brian. Um, okay, let's be the bear. I'm sort of red, green, colorblind but you can probably see a sockeye about to have a very, very bad day. Um, I was closer to this bear than one should ordinarily be but these things do happen. Uh, in Alaska, and the bear is about to do a face plant, and when the claws are out, you know, I grew up in New York City, I was telling John, where the bears were in the zoo or the museum, and the salmon were on bagels with cream cheese, <laughs> and so you can take the city out of the boy, but you know, you see this up close, and maybe many of you have, they're an impressive animal, they really, they really are an impressive creature, and then they give you the stink eye, <laughs> and uh, happens to be a Russian bear. But anyway, you get the idea. You know, you rip and you crunch and you know, you're, you're the bear, you're the, you're the boss. You do what you want. So sometimes you catch a little fish like this, a fresh one, but basically they're taking advantage of habitat that facilitates predation, right? I love this picture. You see, he's got a salmon, and this guy is saying, they got Johnny, but they're not going to get me swimming past his butt. Um, <laughs> that's uh, over in uh, uh, McFit Creek. Anyway, okay, so we got the general idea. Bears are going to kill salmon. That's the main theme of the show tonight. Uh, so I have been involved in work since the early 90s on various aspects of predation by bears on salmon. And this is not demonizing bears. This is just looking at the ecological relationship, right? In the early days, it was like, how many bears do we have to kill in order to control predation so there are more salmon? I think we've gotten a bit beyond that. Um, ecological processes, behavioral and evolutionary, and initially I'm gonna sort of start with the salmon standpoint with the bear as the enemy will kind of turn things around 
you think about the salmon as food for bears because as in any predator-prey relationship, you got, you got both perspectives, right? You got the yin and the yang. Um, most of our work is conducted in Bristol Bay. The University of Washington established field camps in the Wood River system actually before Alaska was a state, before I was born in the late 40s. The Iliamna system, uh, Quijac, shortly after Alaska statehood, about 60, 61. Scott Gendy, a uh, former student of mine, worked in Chichikov Island with the Forest Service, and so I kind of cut back and forth. Most of this is sockeye, all of it is brown bears, but people have studied bears preying on salmon in Japan, in Canada, in Alaska, black bears, brown bears, pink salmon, sockeye salmon. The patterns are remarkably consistent. So it is not unrepresentative, although I do realize, obviously, you do have some local, local variants. Um, you know, the first thing we want to look at is how many in numbers or in proportion salmon get pillow gut bears. Is it, is it like a lot or small? We thought about this, obviously, as, as fishermen. You think, well, if the fishing is tough, you're not going to get as many. If the fishing is easy, you'll do better. So the smaller the stream, the higher the proportion might be killed by bears. And there also may be some safety in numbers, so as scientists we call that density dependence. As there are more and more salmon, the bears may kill up to some plateau, and even bears can't kill everything. So these were kind of our predictions going into this. Um, so kind of visualize, this is a small, fairly experienced bear, but in a shallow stream, you know, the fish looks pretty vulnerable, right? Pretty vulnerable. Uh, and then you say, hmm, this is going to be a bit more challenging. Uh, as the river gets big, at some point the bear is kind of waving as they, as they swim up river. So this graph, I should leave it up for weeks and weeks and weeks because this represents an extraordinary amount of effort. Each dot represents the average for a different stream over approximately 20 years of sampling. So a huge amount of effort to quantify for streams of a given width, and notice that that's on a log scale, the percent of, and these are all sockeye salmon killed by brown bears. And you notice in some of the small streams, it's like 60, 70, approaching 80% of the salmon are killed. Right? And these are quantitative estimates. These aren't just guesses. But as you start getting down to larger rivers, essentially boatable rivers, it goes essentially to zero, and it's not even quantifiable. So it's a huge relationship between the size of the stream, and this happens to be reporting it in width, but it also goes with depth. I mean, bigger water, harder fishing. No big surprise there. But in some small streams, they can really, really get hammered. So the second thing is safety in numbers. Um, bears are large, but not infinitely so. Numerous, but not infinitely so. Hungry, but not infinitely so. I mean, can you satiate bears, and if the salmon run is sufficiently large, do the bears stop taking them? And obviously that's really important from the point of view of bear nutrition, but also salmon population dynamics. So this is one particular stream. I'll return to it several times because it's one of my pet study sites. Hanson Creek is about 12 feet wide. It averages 10 centimeters. What's that? About four or five inches deep. And yes, I do mean inches. You could wade it in extra tufts. Uh, about mile and a half long. So it's a small stream, but has very, very high densities of sockeye salmon. And the number of salmon present, of course, is related to the number of kill, but fairly quickly it reaches a plateau when you've got a certain amount of bouncing up and down. But as you add more and more salmon, you don't get more and more kill. The bears are satiated. And how many bears and do they move around? We'll, we'll get to that. So you can saturate bears if you if you set your mind to it, even a small stream where they're very, very easy to catch. A person could easily catch a salmon with your bare hands in Hanson Creek, right? It, it, is, it is that easy. It's literally ankle deep water. <clears throat> so if you take those same numbers and flip it around, that was the number kill. Now we're going to think about in percent. So for each of you, how likely are you to be killed in a given year, depending on how many of your best friends are in the stream with you? If you come in there in a year with relatively few salmon, you will be somewhere in the 50 to 90% probability of being killed, right? It's not going to look good for you. 
but your likelihood of being killed goes down steeply as the number there. So this, uh, the number, the percent, you basically you can sort of flip those. It's the same data, just graphed differently. This makes sense. Okay, people are nodding. This makes sense. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the number killed on an annual basis. What about the number per day? So I, I haven't I've been updated. This is based on a whole bunch of data. We, we remember this stream is a, a two kilometers long, so a mile and a half long, twelve feet wide. We've had days of six hundred salmon killed per day. We walk this stream every day. One year we had three counts of five hundred killed a day in a row, like fifteen hundred killed in three consecutive days. I kid you not, we're counting them. And then you have days when there are hardly any killed. You think, well, are they all eating salad that day? You know, what's going on? When you count, think about the count per day, you have to think, well, what day of the season? Likewise, if you were a commercial fisherman, how many fish you would catch wouldn't be just any old day. It would be the beginning, the middle, the end of the run, right? It all goes to reason. So what I took is some of our data, and the season basically starts about the 20th of July, and it's over in about four weeks. <clears throat> in the beginning of the season, shown in yellow here, the abundance of salmon is low. It starts out with zero, right? The beginning of the run is zero fish. The first fish come in, graphed on the far side, the, the predation rate, they're essentially certain to be killed. The first salmon that go up the stream are sure to be killed. They are going to get whacked. Then, as the numbers start to build, the bears are continuing to kill fish. They're actually killing more fish per day, but the bears are not able to keep up with the rise of salmon. And then at some point, the salmon are being killed towards the end, but they're also dying of senescence, as we know that they do. And interestingly, at the end, when there are relatively few salmon, the probability of being killed does not rise nearly as steeply as it did in the beginning, because we'll get to this, but of course the quality of the salmon for bears as food is not as high and the bears are now more hungry. So it's a combination, bears are starting to get satiated and the salmon tastes like sneeze. So we get this sense there's a lot of salmon killed. People notice that the salmon in the different streams look different. And so I just pulled some out of our record. The Walk River you go up with a boat, could be a jet boat or a prop boat, it's, mm, I don't know, hundred and something feet across. It's a real river between Lake Nurka and Aleknigik. And so 77 meters, if you don't think metric, that's over 200 feet wide. A and C creeks are literally six feet across, right? These are tiny. So just looking at a selection from a very small stream to a real river, the proportion of salmon spending three years at sea is much higher in the larger rivers. So we have fish of different age, even though they could go to the same place in the ocean, they have the same feeding opportunities, they feed in the same lake, so they have the same growth opportunities in fresh water and salt water. They express a different life history, they're older, and they're also bigger for their age. So they're just much, much bigger fish. I mean, you say fishermen, bigger fish, bigger rivers, common sense. But you say, well, why should that be? So big difference in life history from small to large rivers in the same system. <coughs> so we notice that the bears are killing salmon. So one possibility is that the bears are size selective. That is, you talk to a lot of people and say, well, the bears just kill everything they want. But you know, if you start measuring carefully, and of course, because the salmon are all gonna die, you can measure the ones that were killed by bears and the ones not killed by bears. And if you do it often enough, and I've done it often enough, many tens of thousands of fish we've measured, probably in the hundreds of thousands now, you can determine if the predation is size selective. So one idea is bears might kill the bigger fish either because they're easier to see, makes sense, they choose them, or in shallow water the bigger fish are easier to catch. Then you think, well, why wouldn't everybody be small? But there are advantages to being big. Bigger females can make more eggs than smaller females. They can make bigger eggs. Big males beat up small males. So sexual selection favors bigness. And in this case, we pose the possibility that predation might oppose that. And so each stream would have a different balance between sexual selection favoring being big and bears opposing that. So this is just an example from one, and I apologize for the blue and pink boys and girls, but it conveys the message. <laughs> these are, these bars represent length bins, and this is the probability of being killed for fish of that length. 
So you can see, for example, for females, the very largest females are very, very scarce, and they're essentially certain to get killed. And the smallest ones are much, much, much safer. In the case of males, you have what we call jacks, these fellows that only spent a single year at sea rather than two or three years at sea, much less likely to be killed by bears than the larger ones. So in a stream like Hanson Creek, which is shallow and crystal clear and favors the bears, the big fish are at a great disadvantage and you don't see a lot of those very big fish. So where the bears have the opportunity, their predation is size selective. Does that mean they always kill the big fish? No. Does it mean that they never kill little fish? No, but on average, you are much more likely to be killed if you're big. And again, we don't know whether the bears are choosing you over you, or you're just easier to see or easier to catch, but the effect on the fish is the same. You're dead. Although it isn't, of course, quite that simple. So then in addition to measuring the length of the fish, we look at them. So this is a kind of a classic sockeye, male and female from Hanson Creek, which we would see as essentially the Slim Jim sockeye mode. The male is relatively small in this kind of dorsoventral aspect. Then we go literally across the lake and the very uncreative name of Bear Creek, like how many Bear Creeks are there in Alaska? Okay, it's honest to God, Bear Creek, which is not actually a particularly bear predation rich creek. But anyway, you can see that the fish is deeper bodied. On average, they are longer for their age, they're older, and they are deeper bodied. They're just a bigger fish, even though they have access to the same food in the lake and the same food in the ocean, they have all the same feeding opportunities, natural selection has sculpted these fish differently. And Bear Creek is a harder place for a bear to catch a sockeye. What we notice there is that there are very, very few jacks. The males are bigger, but the interesting thing is, as males get bigger in Bear Creek, they do not get more vulnerable because there's wood, and there are pools, and so those very largest males are not more vulnerable. And so we have a different balance, not only in the probability of being killed, but the extent to which the bears can be size selective, and we see it playing out in the age and size distribution, even though these streams are literally across a narrow lake from each other, right? In fact, a bear could probably swim from one stream to the other. Then we go to sockeye that spawn on beaches. These look like some Chernobyl accident, but in fact, these are the beach spawning sockeye in Iliamna Lake, where they're essentially invulnerable to predation by bears because they're in deep water and the bears can't corner them. And it's a combination that, and I know this is gonna sound like I'm talking out of science here, but either females like males with big humps or males with big humps intimidate other guys with smaller humps but sexual selection favors guys that look like this ladies your choice <laughs> but we definitely see males in dominance displays and the guy with the bigger hump is like i'm i got more than you and they are favored and this is what happens to sockeye salmon when you don't have shallow water and you don't have bears sexual selection kind of goes crazy like the pheasant you know, peacock, peacock tails or something like that. So putting this together, and I, and I know I'm kind of glossing over a lot of the methods and statistics. I thought that you would be okay with that if anybody cares. All our methods are careful and all our data are statistically significant. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it all makes sense. It's all common sense. Salmon in Rivers where they are relatively invulnerable are larger, older, deeper bodied, accruing the benefits in number of eggs and size of eggs in females and being the boss guys, rather than in places where they are more vulnerable to bears. And I'm not intending to suggest that there is no other form of selection besides bears, because there are and I know about them, but bears clearly play a prominent role in the evolution of salmon. I don't, I don't think there's, there's much doubt of it. <clears throat> so, Predation is size selective, the big fish tend to get killed, and it's density dependent. When there are lots and lots of salmon, you're less likely to get killed. So the question is, what is the interaction? This is a thought experiment, okay? So three possibilities. If there are lots of salmon in the stream, again, be, be the bear, think about this for a second. Lots of salmon in the stream, are you gonna be more size selective, only eating the choicest ones because you have more options? That's possible. Or, if the salmon are scarce, will you be more size selective in order to get the best meal? Or, no pattern. 
And as scientists, we like this kind of situation because there are three options, more, less, or no pattern. Thought about this? I, I confess I was not sure how this was gonna work out. In order to analyze this, we had about 20 years of data, and each year we quantified the number of salmon, not only the proportion that got killed, but the extent to which the ones were killed were more or less large compared to the fish that didn't get killed. So we have a measure of how selective the fish. This was a lot of work. This was actually a lot of work. I, I enjoy doing it, and they do pay me, but this was a lot of work. So you got your choices? The pattern was an interesting one. The more dense the salmon, the less size selective they were. Maybe because when there are lots and lots of salmon, it's kind of, I mean, this stream has lots of salmon lots and lots of salmon. It's just kind of chaos, and I'm a bear, and I just kind of wallow in and just grab any old thing. Or maybe when the salmon are scarce, it's easier to spot the big ones and they corner them. I'm not sure what the process is because we don't get in the heads of the bears, although we will get to the bears shortly. But the effect is as salmon are less numerous, the bears are more size selective. Now here's an interesting wrinkle. Any commercial fishermen in the audience, maybe? You know some commercial fishermen? Okay. Gillnet fishing is commonly size selective, right? And gillnet fishing in Bristol Bay is somewhat size selective as the larger fish are more vulnerable. So there's an evolutionary effect of gillnet fishing on the size of salmon. In addition, of course, the gillnet fishing reduces the density. And so it's a double whammy for the fish. It reduces the density, allowing the bears to be more size selective, in addition to the fact that the gillnet fishery is itself size selective. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's just a thing. So, bears tend to kill the largest salmon, especially in small streams, where in fact they can kill most of them. So they, they have the highest predation rate and also the most size selectivity. So the question is, well, what other attributes of the salmon might be important? And of course, you guys are all in Alaska, you know that all of these salmon are gonna die, right? Bears are no bears, death is absolutely certain. So it's, in a way, the fact that the bears kill the salmon is sort of irrelevant, right? Because they're all gonna die, the death is sure. The really important question is whether the bears kill the salmon before or after they breed. If the females got her eggs in the gravel, it's not that big a deal. I mean, I know it might seem so to that particular fish that's getting killed, but evolutionarily, in terms of the population dynamics, it doesn't matter. And if the guy's already spawned, he's gonna die anyway, and if the bear hastens his death by a day, it's really no big deal, right? So the question of whether bears show choice of salmon affects both the bears' use of salmon as food, but also whether those fish are gonna breed because just being killed by a bear is actually not all that important, even though I've sort of talked about it. So if you're a bear, and again, those of you that haven't had dinner can think about this, you might wanna kill newly arrived salmon because they're more tasty, they have more energy but they may be harder to catch. You might tend to kill fish that have been in the stream a long time because they're gonna be, eat. in fact, if they're dead, they're even easier to catch and you do see bears scavenging dead fish, right? So that's, they're really easy to catch. And then the real question, and you can see where I'm leading you on this is, might it vary from stream to stream, whether you kill newly arrived fish or not? So to answer this question, we consider it again, you know, do you want a frisky fish like this? Lots of nutrition, females got her eggs, a lot of fat, but that will be a harder fish to catch. Uh, and in a really shallow stream, this is, these are, Hanson Creek averages 10 centimeters deep. I kid you not, 10 centimeters. That's like what, four inches or something like that? Most of the fish are partly out of water for most of their lives in this stream. This is really, really easy fishing. You know, you think you got easy fishing on the rivers around here. This is really easy fishing. This is literally sight fishing. That fish is partly out of water. But, you know, even easier fishing is a dead fish, right? You know, they don't even swim away at all. And they're there. You know they're there by the thousands or tens of thousands. But the female will have spawned her eggs that are typically about 20% of her mass and a large fraction of the energy. Males lose fat and protein, so there's a reason why y'all go sport fishing, don't just yard these things off the beach, right? You, you, you know why you don't do that, right? You know why you don't do that. Uh, 
So to do this kind of study, my students and I rounded up salmon and we catch them, we measure them, we tag them, and we wait till they enter the streams or start spawning. And we know how many days they're alive in the stream before they get killed. Not just whether or not they get killed, but whether they get killed on the first day or the second day or after a long time. And you do this for multiple years and multiple streams, you start to develop the patterns. So the first pattern is sort of the Hanson Creek pattern. Remember, this is, this is bear fishing heaven. And what we see is the fish that die of senescence, that is just kind of fall apart and die, typically live between about a week and two weeks. A few might hang on for three weeks and a few pre-spawning mortality after a few days, but that period, most of the bear kills are killed in the first couple of days in the stream. And it's as though if the fish has lived in the stream more than three or four days, the bears start to leave them alone. Not that they never kill them, but they are less likely to get killed the longer they're in the stream. And people say, oh, huh, I mean, how, how can a bear tell if the fish has been in the stream a long time? I think, well, I can tell. It's easy for me to tell. A spawned out fish from a not spawned out fish. Bears have perfectly good vision, so I don't see why they wouldn't be able to tell. So this is just kind of all the fish together. We ran it through some mathematical models. We can calculate for each day, like your first day, your second day, how likely are you to get killed? And so in Hanson Creek, the curve looks like this. So the, the first day in the stream, you're the most likely to get killed. And every su successive day, even though you're getting weaker and less able to get away, you are less likely to get killed by the bears. So it means here the bears are typically killing salmon before they have spawned which is important for the population dynamics because of course they won't have any children and also important for their evolution because they won't have any children. So then we go to another stream in the same system called Pick Creek. Pick Creek is wider and deeper. The number of fish killed is more because it's a larger stream. The proportion of fish killed is not that different but it's harder for the bears to kill newly arrived fish because they're pools and wood. And so here, look back here, remember this pattern, this is a stream where it's easy to catch them. You go to Pit Creek, the newly arrived fish are actually seldom caught and there is a slight increase in the likelihood of getting killed the longer you're in the stream. And you notice that they also live longer. But even if the bears don't kill them, they live longer, it's as though they are, they're actually programmed to live longer because they're less likely to get killed. And then my student Bobette Dickerson worked a, a pink salmon stream near Huna, and certainly a person, even with a dip net, has a struggle catching fish in the stream. There's lots of wood, deep pools, fast cuts, it's a structurally much more complicated stream. You can see the bear saying, hmm, what are we going to do here? And, kind of falling over and doing a face plant, but um, certainly qualitatively a much, much more challenging environment for bears. Not only do they kill a smaller proportion, but look at this, They're, the, the salmon are essentially invulnerable when they arrive, and the bears are largely scavenging fish at death or just a few days before because it is just too hard. And that's important because these fish will all have got their eggs in the gravel for the females. The males will have probably sired all or a large fraction of the offspring that they would. And so after three weeks in the stream, if a bear kills a salmon, it's a big so what from the point of view of the salmon. And so it makes a big, big difference. And again, habitat controls not only the probability of being killed, but how selective the bear can be. So to put this in perspective, and this is my son as sort of a standard small human at about the age of 10, A and C Creek are tiny. We're talking a trickle, barely the width of this table. And most of the salmon there are killed within the first three days in the stream. And here he is a couple years older with one of his buddies wandering around these ponds, which are the size of a basketball court or bigger. And the bears kill the salmon, but on average the salmon have been there for two weeks before they get killed. So it's a totally, totally different game. So the proportion of salmon killed is really kind of misleading, and I sort of deliberately misled you, and I hope you're okay with that. So this this makes make sense where this is going. <clears throat> so I have to tell you, I am not a bear biologist. I do not pretend to be one. I do know something about salmon, but you can't be involved in any predator-prey interaction without starting to get interested in the other side. And 
that is actually a Russian bear, and I was quite close to that bear. So we have tried to think about the bears, and people inevitably ask how many bears are killing the salmon, how much they move around, lots of questions about bear biology. Um, this is mostly what we have in terms of bear viewing. The streams that we work on, unlike McNeil River and Brooks, are small, they're fairly heavily vegetated. By the time we see a bear, we're too close. We're in their personal space. I'm a teacher, we have students, we have to be super safety conscious because of you know, faculty we can lose, but students we can't. <laughs> so we make a lot of noise and we sing badly and so forth. <clears throat> we don't have a lot of observational data. Most of what we know about bear predation is looking at dead fish, okay? But we have been taking DNA samples for a number of years, setting out cameras and all that sort of thing, which I can talk about later if someone is curious. Uh, the, the method, unlike a situation where people bait the bears in with a stinky bait or Twinkies or something like that, we just put small strands of barbed wire across these streams and the bears are walking up and down all the time. And so sometimes we get kind of a big Donald Trump hair piece like that. Sometimes it's more like a strand or two. The follicles have DNA. We can process that and also get some chemical information from the hair. Uh, send it off to the geneticist. Some of these small streams have a lot of different bears. Hanson Creek, again, a mile and a half long, will be visited by 20 or more bears in a one month season. That's a minimum estimate. Some of those may be fishing nearby streams, but there are lots of bears, clearly vastly more than could be supported by that kind of habitat without those runs of salmon. They undoubtedly disperse to other areas off season, but during that period, there are I mean, we, we, we rarely see them because we make so much noise and we sing so badly, but there are lots and lots of, of bears fishing these streams. Um, then we start thinking the importance of the carcass of the salmon for the bear is another way of looking at whether bears are killing newly arrived fish or not, I'm thinking about salmon as food. And doubtless, if you've been walking around streams, you've seen some cases where the salmon has kind of been corn cobbed like that. There's the head of a female, and the bear has eaten essentially all of the body. In other cases, they take a bite out of the cranium there, maybe a bite out of the hump, and leave the rest. There's a lot of meat left on that. And this is, again, not something original that I discovered, but we've, we've quantified this quite a lot. <laughs> how much do you leave? How much do you eat? I mean, you be the bear. You've got this thing in your jaws. You've killed it. It's on the bank. You take a rip out of it. Why not keep eating it? Seems like a perfectly reasonable question. Um, so the short answer is how much you eat depends on how good that carcass is as a meal and how easier it's going to be to get the next one. So this is some work that Scott Gendy actually was working for the Forest Service at that time, quantified for pink and chum salmon how much energy is in a salmon, male and female, as a function of how many days they're in the stream. And they lose energy fast. So upon entry to five days later to 10 days later, a very precipitous drop, particularly in females, because after within the first five days is almost always spawn. So the eggs are 20% of the female's mass and more than 20% of her energy. So both fat and protein is a huge change in the energetic value of a salmon as food for a bear within the first few days. But even males, you know, all that banging around and fighting is a lot of work. They go through fat and protein very, very rapidly. And by the time they die, a week and a half, two weeks later, there's a tremendous loss of energy. So the value of a salmon is food for the bear depends very, very strongly on how recently it's arrived. So in some of Scott's work, the mass eaten from spawned out and ripe fish is hugely different. They eat way, way, way less tissue from those fish. You think, well, how can the bear tell? Well, I can tell. I don't see why the bear couldn't. They got perfectly good vision, great sense of smell. They got the feedback. I don't see this as being a difficult discrimination for them at all. So what we commonly see, and again, we is not just my group, but people over in Japan, people in chum salmon in British Columbia, other parts of Alaska, it's very, very common. Females are commonly consumed right in the belly area, which of course is where the eggs are. Males also often in the brain area and the hump. 
and you can quantify these things that we have for many, many tens of thousands of fish over lots and lots of years. Um, so sometimes this is what we call brain and body, meaning the brain and the body has been eaten. That's all that's left of the salmon, you know, the, the, the jaw is there. And then you got a lot of this, a bite of the hump, maybe a quarter of a kilo taken out and just left there on the bank or in the stream to go get another one. You know, sort of think about yourselves at the smorgasbord, you know, you're gonna put that roll back after taking a bite and hold out for the prime rib or something like that. There's a lot of meat left on that fish. A lot of meat left on that fish. Uh, classic belly bitten, you know, just a bite taken out there, presumably squished out the eggs and left the rest to go get something else. So I just pulled out one year from our database. We've done this more years than I care to remember. Just to give you a feel, for males and females, about a quarter of the fish are bitten and killed and with no tissue consumed whatsoever. That's you've got the big canine teeth holes, kirk, and dropped. So in the jaws of death, and not any tissue eaten at all, body eaten 40 to 50%, so only about 40% of the fish do they eat most of the tissue that's available? The belly occasionally in males, and interestingly in smaller males, you wonder maybe the bear mistook that smaller male for female. Belly much more often in females. The hump typically in males, occasionally in females, and interestingly tending to be large females, as though maybe they're, oops, sorry. Now, the hump, it turns out, actually is not particularly nutritious. It may just be a convenient point of attachment, like you stick your head in the water and there you got it, and then you sort of shake it back and forth, and that's, that's what you got. Um, okay, here's the touchy part. They eat the brains more for males and females. So I gravitate to the explanation that males have bigger brains. My collaborator, Mary Wilson, says it's because guys have fat heads, because there's actually a lot of fat in the brain. Right, because you need the myelin sheets. And so it is small, but it's actually relatively energy dense. And again, lots of fish eaten with nothing eaten from them. So <clears throat> I have to tell you about this sort of situation. Occasionally we would see this. This is a sockeye with a great big chunk of his hump. And I assumed that these were cases where the bear had the fish and he somehow writhed free and escaped the jaws of death. I think in some cases that might occur, but in other cases the bear just took a bite and just let him go, and somehow the wound cauterized and it didn't bleed to death and it didn't hit the spinal cord and the fish survived. So we not that uncommonly see fish with just horrific wounds. And if you're a trout fisherman, you think how you gotta baby that rainbow trout. You couldn't just take a massive divot out of the fish like that without killing it, and yet we see some really nasty wounds in some of these fish. So, this, and I apologize, the picture is a little grainy. These were taken with a film camera. The young people may not know what that is. <laughs> I, I nicknamed this fish Headless Harry of Hanson Creek. So these are the teeth made by the, the canine tooth holes of the bear. So the bear stuck his head in the water, got this fish. This is its eye. So it basically ate the whole top of its cranium off. Uh, Tanya Hibbing is now showing the fish. <laughs> This fish, a man among men, lived, we know that, seven days courting females, alive like this. I mean, you want to talk about the guy you want to marry. This is a <laughs> fish. This is an awesome, awesome fish. Seven days with those wounds, which is about as long, uh, yeah, or, or how important a guy's brain is for his sex drive. You know, that's, <laughs> that is the alternative explanation. But anyway, a cool story and, and not a word of a lie. Um, Seven days, that's pretty damn tough. So anyway, the, the general pattern, I think you're kind of getting the message here. The bears feed to maximize energy density, not mass. I mean, at some point, spawned out salmon is like eating wet cardboard, right? You can fill your belly, but there's very, very little nutrition to it. So you want to maximize energy density when salmon are very, very abundant. But as they are, if in seasons where they are less abundant and situations where they're more difficult to catch, they eat more from them. I haven't talked about scavenging. We've actually tagged dead fish and bears do scavenge, but they scavenge more in situations where salmon are harder to catch and they tend to scavenge more valuable fish rather than ratty fish. 
and when they're scarce, even a ratty salmon is, is better than, than nothing. Although obviously bears do need more to eat than just salmon. They're, salmon are not nutritionally complete. They have to eat some berries and other things, but salmon are certainly very important. Um, I'm not a bear biologist, so rather than showing any data, I'm gonna to refer to work done chiefly by a guy named Grant Hildebrand, who was a doctoral student in Washington State University, now works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He and lots of other people have done just outstanding work on bear biology, thinking about the importance of salmon as food for bears rather than the other way around. Um, and I'll just show a few photographs and you can kind of get the message, but the density of bears, size, number and survival of cubs are all positively related to how much food meat there is, and meat is especially salmon. So, you know, you've seen these kinds of pictures. Bears are actually not all that friendly to each other. In fact, absent hunting, the main cause of mortality would probably be other bears. When you see them in these aggregations, it's normally because there's so much food that some of their interpersonal animosity is overcome like at Brooks Falls, or less famous places where you see them kind of talking it over like this with a bunch of dead fish. This is a, a moraine creek over in the Alagnaxes. And when, when salmon are very abundant, you'll see bears much more commonly together, but other than that, they, they don't. Size, you know, this is sort of one of these whoppers that you see there, and they do get very big. I, I had occasion to photograph this bear. This is over at Chignik. Look at this, like a dog. This is not an unhealthy animal, it just hasn't had the chow yet. You know, it's waiting. They'll add hundreds of pounds in a very short period of time feeding on salmon. They go through this period, the bear biologists call hyperphagia. They really, really, really pack on the pounds. Moms to, to give birth and nurse dens and all of them to pass through that period of time. Even in zoos, zoo bears will put on hundreds of pounds in the fall, just as a natural process. And the size of bears varies, obviously, but in places where there's high access to lots and lots of meat, especially salmon, Kodiak, most conspicuously, but lots of other places, the coastal brown bears are just way bigger than grizzlies in the interior. And at the end of the season, you got these kind of sumo wrestler type things that can barely walk. I don't know if any of you have seen, but and, and Brooks, they actually have like the fattest bear contest. It's really hilarious because some of the bears are recognized like the before and after, and some of these things are beyond beyond obese. <laughs> They're really, really, really extraordinary. Um, it turns out, I, I didn't know this, but bears mate in the spring, but get this girls, they delay implantation until the fall. Think about that. So, Depending on how well the feeding has been over the summer season, she might implant one or two or three or more embryos. Season has been bad, you don't implant as many. And so the number of cubs born is related to the availability of food because that's mom's natural birth control. Uh, <clears throat> four is not that uncommon in areas where there's lots and lots of food. In other areas, it would be quite extraordinary. That happens to be Brooks. Um, I know, it's a gratuitous cute bear picture, but in places where there are lots and lots of food, you see more triplets and, and, and so forth. Um, I had occasion to be over in Russia, and you know, there's this notion that mom feeds the kids. Well, based on my experience, that is not the way that it works. In this case, it's very, very obvious. There are lots of females. They got to watch lots of bears. Mom catches a salmon and starts to eat it. And then the kids scramble around and get as much as they can before mom wolfs it all down and hopes she gets another one. So it's not like she's killing the fish and tossing it aside to the kids. No, she's looking after herself. And so there she is sort of ripping a sockeye in half and there's Junior kind of coming around. And in this case, the little fellow off to the right had a wound, a conspicuous injury on, on his hip, his her hip like it had been tagged by some bigger bear and just wasn't able to scramble in there. And mom was not taking the fish and shooing the other cubs aside and letting this guy get some. I mean, it, you know, you hate to be cruel, it's not a Disney moment. This guy was not gonna make it, right? And she was eating as fast as she could. The fish were in water, which would have been for a human at least waist deep. So she had to work a bit to get those fish. And when she got one, she was eating it and the kids were getting getting the scraps off to the side. You can see two of the aggressive cubs right in there 
getting some, and I felt sad for the little fellow, but obviously there was nothing I was going to do about it. Uh, was not going not to make it. Um, the likelihood of those cubs making it to their second season is, again, positively related to how much food there is and the mom's ability to, to look after them. Uh, another nice kind of mother and child moment for those of us that are parents. Um, and there isn't time to go into all the ecosystem aspects, but you think about for pinks and chums, the salmon are out in the ocean. In the case of sockeye, they might be in a lake relatively inaccessible to bears as food. They then come into small streams where they're much more accessible and of course will die anyway. And the bear, in a way, is redirecting the nutrients towards aquatic or terrestrial pathways. The dead fish are gonna go someplace, right? You know, matter and energy are not created or destroyed. They only change form, right? Basic physics. But where they go depends on a series of these ecosystem things. So, and I, apologies to those of you that may yet be having dinner. Um, maggots are a lot less charismatic than bears, but these are the larvae of blowflies that oviposit in salmon carcasses have a huge, huge role of nutrient cycling, at least in the streams that I study. Tremendous amount of carcass material that's deposited in the riparian zone is chowed down by blowfly maggots. But of course they can only do so on land. And carcasses in the water are not accessible to them. They might be worked on by caddisfly larvae and so forth, right? They're gonna go to somebody. So the bear biologists tell us that urination is actually more important than death. It's kind of vulgar that I snuck up on this little female bear and watched her take a leak. But it does get the message. There is nutrient cycling through waste deposition and Bears do go in the woods, and another way of <laughs> nutrients going from one place to the other. Um, and the carcasses just rot, kind of pretty picture taken by a former student, uh, absent any of these things, they'll be worked on by microbes, so the nitrogen, the carbon, the phosphorus, and so forth is gonna go someplace, whether it ends up in the forest, or in the stream, or in the lake, depends in part on flooding, obviously, but also movement by predators, and lots of animals will eat salmon, ravens, and, and so forth, but relatively few, basically only bears are big enough and strong enough and numerous enough to really move that much in terms of carcasses. You know, we, we keep track of gulls pecking salmon, but it's nothing like the same role that bears do. Um, so the kind of the take home message from an ecological standpoint is habitat and density. Physical habitat variation among streams with depth, woody debris, and so forth, controls the proportion of fish that can be killed and the selectivity, and these are also mediated by density. So as density goes up, the bears eat less from each fish, they are, they are killing a smaller fraction, and as the population is less and less dense, the bears are gonna get their cut, and they will work quite hard to get their cut, and I've seen situations where they kill virtually every fish. Um, so from the salmon standpoint, this affects their population dynamics and their evolutionary ecology. From the bear standpoint, the consumption patterns and what they eat, what they leave, carcasses, scavenging, and all of those things are important because salmon are particularly important to bears as food for all the reasons that people like Grant and, and other scientists have shown. Um, I have personally participated in this work for a long time, but obviously not, not solo. University of Washington has field camps in the Wood River and Ileana Lake established, well, the Wood River before I was born, before Alaska was a state. I've been involved for 30-something years. We have an enormous number of students and staff that have been involved in this work. And actually, Greg Ruggeroni and Don Rogers preceded me by a couple of years and then sort of passed the baton to me. So I always like to, to credit those guys uh, where the work was done. Um, Maybe one last picture of a bear. Thank you again for sharing some of your evening with me. Uh, we have done more than I described here, but I thought that that would make a reasonable package. I will take any questions. I will stick around as long as anybody wants to talk fish. Uh, thanks again for coming. And I gotta say on behalf of myself and my nephew and my brother, you got a wonderful community here. We've loved the fishing. I don't know why I haven't come here sooner. I'm definitely gonna come back here again. Uh, Thanks for sharing Cordova with us.
Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah, you said that they tend to um, kill the fish when they first enter the river. If they can. If they can. And how fast are the, uh, the fish spawning? Typical in, in a lot of these streams where the sockeye hold in the lake prior to moving onto the spawning ground. So they don't move up there until they're right. Uh, they've essentially all spawned within four days. They'll start spawning uh, within the first day to two days. Female will typically make roughly four egg pockets with different breeding events. You know, some of the things like coho salmon here that are coming in over a longer period, they may be in the stream a longer period of time before breeding, but the situation that we have, a lot of the pinks and chums, they'll be breeding within a, a day of when they leave salt water in lots of cases. So um, even though they get killed, they've done their deed. Right, and of course the female will have completed spawning all of her eggs. The males have sufficient amount of sperm that they will attempt to breed as long as they are there. So even the males that are dead of senescence will have some milk, some sperm left, although it will be less than they had depending on how many parties they went to. But their ability to fight their way in to compete with other males will depend. So the effect on females is somewhat different from the effect on males. Because a male after a week might still have some breeding opportunities where the female will have no role other than guarding her nest literally until she dies. And then I have one other sure, question. Sure, of course. With the cubs, um, do you find that the cubs tend to eat the dead fish if they have to wait for mom to give them a lot? Uh, you know, that is a good question. In a lot of our cases, we don't know, mm -hmm. right? Because of the nature of these streams don't really facilitate direct observations. Uh, the camera work that we do indicates that a lot of the predation actually occurs at dawn, dusk, and at night. Of course, in mid-July, that's not a whole whole lot of night, but the daytime when we are there is actually the low period of predation. It may be in part because they know that we're there and they, they move off, but in general, bears have very good low light level vision. They, they can feed in these streams very effectively at night. So it would be difficult for us to watch them. We've set up cameras, we've taken videos, but we, we don't really know. I, I would guess that that might be so. I've seen in, in cases where I've been able to watch cubs, they're somewhat less competent than their mothers, uh, but they'll still catch fresh sea run fish, places like McFit Creek over in the uh, Cook Inlet. So when they can, they'll, they'll take the fresh ones. They mess around with them longer, they take longer to, to physically eat them. Bear can eat a whole salmon in two minutes, small salmon in two minutes. Yeah. So uh, Wood River has some mega escapements, Yes, lately. probably totally unrelated to bears, but yes, go ahead. Despite continuous fishing, it's constant fishing. And I was just curious if that recently, if those data are big outliers for you, both the bear terms and bear terms, or just how that has affected, what have you noticed in response right. to the negative? Well, yeah, what, what she's referring to, many of you probably know, the last couple of years, Bristol Bay has seen very, very large runs, although you know, the expression, the rising tide lifts all boats. When it comes to salmon, the rising tide does not lift all boats. So not all of Bristol Bay has seen very, very large runs. So Eggy Geek this year was off the charts and Ileana Lake was rather disappointing. So they don't all achieve the same level of, of up and down. The Wood River system, where we do a lot of this work, has seen very, very large runs, despite, as you say, fairly heavy, heavy fishing. But not every stream sees it because some years there are more in this, and some years there are more in that. This stream has more five-year-olds, this stream has more four-year-olds. So it may be a very, very average year in some streams when it's very, very large in another one. So that's part of the reason why we work on these 25-year data sets. Um, we have seen some very large runs, and it sort of follows the rule. The bears only can eat so many, and if you have 20,000, they don't eat that many more than if you have 15. They may eat less from each fish, right? And in fact, hypothetically, if you let more and more salmon up the river, in, in principle, if you wanted to feed the bears, they might be taking less from each fish and killing a larger number, but you wouldn't actually, in, in that case where there's already a, a great deal of food, probably be benefiting them. But over at Iliamna Lake, this, this year, some of those ponds where I work had very skinny runs and the bears were killing virtually everything. So, Bristol Bay is a big place. I guess, and I got one more. Sure. Um, on the headless 
Harry, Harry. or whatever his name <laughs> was. Um, you pretty much are, are only counting fish that you either observe being killed on your camera data or Which is a portion of a carcass. Right. We s you know, obviously this is a judgment call. That's a good question. There is a lot of methodological stuff. So if we observe a fish with what would be a mortal wound, we, and, and, and Hanson Creek we survey every day, so it's a pretty high intensity of sampling, we assume that that fish was killed. We do know that some scavenging occurs because we actually tag dead fish and leave them out, and we can quantify and so a stream that was only visited less often, some of the fish that we would have said were killed were in fact probably scavenged. And so, so the scavenging <clears throat> would elevate the apparent predation. But the other thing that happens is some of the fish are killed and essentially abducted. We call them MIAs, missing in action. So if we tag fish, we'll see the fish in the stream, boom, day one, day two, day three, gone. And these fit the same size and timing distribution as those that are killed. So some of the fish are being killed by bears and taken away, and those are fish that are missing. And so, in that sense, the true predation is even higher than we're estimating. With scavenging, it's actually lower. So those are offsetting sources of error. We've quantified both of them, although it's not exactly equivalent. But yeah, this is we do see them watching. You know, we do see them when we have video of them killing salmon. But that's not the majority of the data. The majority of the data are from carcasses. Yeah? Do you, do you by any chance measure berry production and see if that influences the You rate? know, this is a really interesting point. Some folks in Kodiak have some really interesting data on availability of berries. And one of the things of having a long career is at some point you think, crap, if I've been recording that <laughs> all this time, I'd really have it. You know, there are places where I start thinking, if I had 20 years ago started putting out little quadrats and counting berries, I wasn't thinking about that. You kind of back, a lot of these things didn't start with a perfect study plan. You kind of back in and you start doing something and a student comes along and we don't have good data. In fact, we don't have any quantitative data on the availability of berries, but some cool work in Kodiak suggests that it does have a significant effect. Part of the thing is salmon are not nutritionally complete bears. They do need to eat other things. They're very omnivorous. Right on these salmon streams, we see lots of scat that's loaded with plant material. Lately, and I don't want to get too far into the chemistry, but by taking the hair of the bears, you can infer something about its diet from the isotopes of nitrogen and carbon. And so in addition to taking DNA from these, we have multiple years and multiple streams of essentially a chemical estimate of the proportion of salmon in its diet without telling you how we do it. And right on these streams, there are some bears that are essentially vegans. Like they're walking right up Hanson Creek, the easiest fishing that there could be, with essentially no salmon component in their diet, all the way up to very, very heavy reliance. So in the samples that we have, it suggests quite a large range in how important or, or how much salmon they are eating. And we're just starting to to, to unravel that, but we don't have information on the alternate prey. We don't know, you know, they'll eat a dead caribou or a dead moose or kill a moose or something like that. We don't have information on those alternate, you know, the, the availability of alternate prey, which would undoubtedly play, play some role. I, I know there's uh, decades of data on escapement, salmon escapement in Bristol Bay. Yes. Um, and I'm just wondering, I know you're not a fair biologist, but I'm wondering if if you or anyone else has looked at population cycles in bears to, to look at, at that to see if there's a kind of a population yeah. cycle that can be explained by this. I, right? I have reached out to the ADF and G biologists. Part of the problem is that Bristol Bay, the area where we work, is not a destination hunt place like Kodiak where there's a huge amount of research, nor is it a crisis. Right? And, and research money tends to follow either super abundance or super scarcity. It's just kind of another place. So there's not been dedicated bear research there. Uh, the management units where they keep track of the hunting is not spatially structured to be particularly informative for us. That sounds like a lame answer, but it's true. We were, I, was, I attempted to make that connection and did not get very far because the data that they collect, and some bears are tagged there and some are tagged as they are leaving the state. It's really hard to know, it, it was hard, I could not get the number of bears killed in the vicinity where we do our work. 
the numbers are aggregated at a much broader scale. And so I, I don't know. A good bear biologist might be able to make more of those things. Um, I have not dug deeper than that. But I do appreciate that that's obviously important. And you would expect that there would be some time lag, but there would be some relationship. Uh, they now, I believe, have spring and fall hunts. There's a fair amount of hunting pressure, so as to still see 20 to 30 bears on a mile and a half stream, 12 feet wide, boy, there's a lot of bears because they're killing bears too. It's not like they're protected there. Um, but anything beyond that. We, we do know that many of the bears will return to the same stream in subsequent years, so we do now have multiple years of DNA samples, uh, but they do move among adjacent streams, not, not surprisingly. Yes, sir. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I was just uh, going to recommend that you briefly describe this uh, work that you did about flinging carcasses on oh. one side versus yeah. the other side of the street. Yeah, so well, this is one of these things. When you're counting salmon every day, you can't leave them there because they keep accumulating. So we, I decided we had to throw the fish away from the stream to avoid counting them the next day. And 20 years ago, I said, well, let's always throw them to well, it's our right as we walk upstream, which would be true river left, with the idea being we could look at the fertilization of those carcasses. And so after 20 years, I, I forget exactly, <clears throat> like 60,000 pounds of carcass. It was a huge, tremendous amount. It, it adds up. Some individual years, we've had up to 60,000 sockeye in a two kilometer stream. There's a lot of salmon there. And we cored the trees on both sides of the stream. And the cores went back 40 years, so we had 20 years before we started chucking the carcasses, and then 20 years after the carcass manipulation. And the kind of weird thing is it's not like we had sequoias on one side and bonsai on the other, you know. It turns out that the side that we fertilized with the carcasses had originally slower growing trees, probably because of topographical shading and, and so forth. And essentially, a huge increase in carcasses basically allowed that side to catch up. So it did facilitate the growth of the trees, but tree growth is really strongly controlled by lots of other things. So, I mean, all other things being equal, salmon carcasses, yes, but it's a, it's a comparatively small effect relative to whether it's south-facing or north-facing, drainage and things like that. But it kind of made a lot of publicity because there are, you know, pictures of students, you know, hucking salmon, sailing through the, sailing through the air and ending up in the bank. Uh, the message was, yes, there is an effect, but it's a modest effect. You know, again, it's not as though you throw enough carcasses, you're going to have giant trees. That's, uh, it, it has been maybe overblown by some people, not to poke a, a hole in the balloon. Um, but it was kind of cool, because you rarely have a 40, you know, like a 20 year before and a 20 year after experiment. You know, that was kind of fun. Thanks for mentioning that. Yes? Um, did you look at the ranking of salmon species, you know, which that, that effect? <laughs> that is a very, the, the blessing and curse of our system is that they're essentially sockeye monocultures. Yeah. There are, I mean, anything other than a sockeye, like, wow, I saw a chum today. You know, it's, it's unusual to see anything but a sockeye in these streams. And it makes it clean. They're all brown bears. We've analyzed hundreds and hundreds of DNA samples. Never a black bear. One year we saw a wolf on the cameras, but I mean, it's essentially, it's a bear, brown bear, red salmon system. And you think, well, okay, chum are bigger, so would they be more desirable? But let's, let's hypothetically say pinks arrived early, and so they might get hit more because they're early, and the chums might get hit more because they're large. It would be interesting to have a situation like that. We don't have that luxury. We tend to, the beauty of having field cams is you can get these long-term data sets, but the curse of field cams is you tend to do your work over and over in the same place. They make you site attached. I think that'd be extremely interesting and I could see it going either way, but we, we see so few of the other species it doesn't even, you know, we don't, don't even have a record of it. Okay, oh, yes, sir. I have a question. Sure. Uh, it has to do with that slide that you showed about the, the time of, uh, time that the fish stayed in the stream mm -hmm. and uh, in correlation with like, their percentage of body fat. Likely, path. oh, yes, right. Yes, yeah, yes. so were you collecting that information from uh, like the mouth of the stream or is it like the mouth of like the lake? That or, particular where, where stream, 
the uh, first initial right. Reading. That particular work was done by Scott Gendy in uh, Chichikov. Uh, with appropriate permits, they sacrificed some fish because <clears throat> this information was destruct. These were destructive samples. Although now we have electronic ways of there's electronic fat meters, which right. is kind of cool. In that case, they did a total proximate analysis, protein, fat, all the different stuff. And then they, they took a random sample of fish that had been tagged and had been in the stream five days, and another random sample of fish that had been tagged and lived in the stream for 10 days. So it's not the same fish. Although I'm sure if you had the same fish, you'd see the same pattern. I mean, they really, really lose energy very fast. And again, with the eggs and the female, it's inevitable. I mean, you look at a salmon that's been in the stream for 10 days, two weeks. I mean, they really look like they've been through the war. Um, and now we would do that with that electronic meter if we did it again. Okay, well thanks again. I'll stick around if anyone wants to chat.